What is your reaction to Donald Trump's comments about enemies within and VP Harris's response tonight? Yeah, Steph, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're leading with that because I think this is really, if you want to know what's the difference uh, between Donald Trump now and, say, in 2016, it is not just the dark rhetoric, but it is the very explicit threats to deploy the military against American citizens. And, you know, I think what's really notable about this is that people say, well, Donald Trump is hyperbole, whatever. He spent all of 2020, had he not been constrained by his own Secretary of Defense, Attorney General, and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, that's exactly what he would have done in the summer of 2020. He wanted to use the military against American citizens, uh, and it was only the resistance of his top officials that prevented him from doing so in the summer of 2020. He's now saying that he would do so, uh, and explicitly in the context of the election. I would also point out that Trump's use of the term enemy within is, is one of the most uh, harrowing things that he says to anyone who's looked at the history of countries that have had dictatorships. Look at the history of 20th century uh, totalitarian governments. That's what they do, is they talk about purging the enemy from within. And this rhetoric, I think, is something that's very much an escalation from Donald Trump in the last few weeks. You know my next question, Charlotte, to you. And first of all, I, I apologize to Susan and Sam. Before Charlotte even speaks tonight, she's already won my MVP. She has arrived on set with a reporter's notebook, and she has got notes filled out cover to cover. <laughs> so you two lose. Charlotte wins tonight. Charlotte, Donald Trump has been saying these types of things since we met him in 2016. And Susan's right. We didn't hear rhetoric like this a month before the election then. But much, 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 much of what he has said and done don't matter to voters. Yeah. Do you think these comments now will make a difference? I mean, like Susan said, this is really, really alarming. Uh, however, I is have... <laughs> you know, I mean, I have, I have been talking to voters <laughs> around the country for eight years now. And when I meet voters who do support Donald Trump, uh, they... And I ask them... What, what do you think about the latest thing that he said? I mean, I'm thinking back to four years ago when he was, uh, you know, calling veterans losers. I would mm -hmm. approach people, normal people in parking lots and say, what do you think of these latest comments? People didn't care. They either didn't hear or didn't care or didn't believe that he said them. Sam, Donald Trump is talking about enemies within. It seems like to me, right, everyone here at this table and you two at home follow what he says day in and day out. To me, who does pay attention, it feels like his rhetoric is getting darker and darker as we get closer to the election. Where do you think all of this is headed? Well, Stephanie, let me uh, consult my reporter's notebook here <laughs> that I've written my notes down. Just need to make sure I get on your good list. Uh, where Pretty is it good. setting? It's, it's obviously, it's in a dark place. I mean, we're, we're not in a great place uh, on a cultural or political perspective. I would like to say that, you know, this is what we should expect from Trump, but I do agree with Susan. I think it's actually gotten a lot darker over the past couple of weeks. I think the surprising thing, if, if, I, if I were to say there is a surprise, is that um, the, the sort of lack of uh, outrage by more Republicans, obviously, we know that Liz Cheney um, is against Donald Trump. We know that Mark Milley has spoken out to Bob Orton about Donald Trump. But there are other Republicans out there who see this rhetoric, who know the dangers associated with it, and who are still choosing to remain on the sideline. Then you see other Republicans, like tonight, uh, Glenn Youngkin, governor of Virginia, asked about this uh, on CNN and just sort of skirted around the issue when clearly he knows better. Um, and so that, I think, is the most surprising. We, we Our expectations for Trump are fairly low, uh, and he's managing to, you know, meet them. But I think our expectations for other Republicans to speak out against this type of behavior, especially after January 6, uh, were a bit higher. And that has been uh, what's shocking for a lot of us is to see them just sit back and just let the election happen in silence. Well, you know who's not letting the election happen in silence? The candidates. Uh, Susan, VP Harris and Governor Walz are laser focused on the blue states this week, Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. How much of this do you believe is to make sure they don't fall prey to the fate of Hillary Clinton in 2016 in terms of where her focus was and where she missed? 
You know, it's interesting for all of the, you know, I have to say in the last week, I felt a certain amount of 2016 flashback. However, no one is going to wake up uh, the morning after the election and be shocked. If Donald Trump wins, they may be upset. They may be uh, uh, wanting to be surprised, but they're not going to be like stunned. This is inconceivable. The reality of the 50-50 nation that we've been living with uh, these last, we're now nine years into the Trump era in American politics. So unlike the Clinton campaign in 2016, nobody is going to uh, think that there's overconfidence on the part of Democrats. Quite the opposite. I would say the last week has been uh, a level of panic uh, that I really I haven't heard <laughs> even in these last eight years. Sam, well, we've heard a lot of noise about Kamala Harris not doing enough media. Obviously, last week was a huge blitz, another one this week. And Wednesday, she is sitting down for an interview with Fox News. Will that end the trash talk yeah. about her avoiding media? I'm not sure what, what I mean, uh, once she does this, what will Fox News have to rail on about her and, and, and the media come Thursday? I'm sure they'll find something, right? You know, the, it would, it, it maybe the, the interview was too short or wasn't done live, it was edited. You know, they'll find something to complain about. I, I think, look, if you look at this media blitz, um, it is high stakes, high reward, right? I mean, going on Fox uh, is adversarial as it gets for her. Uh, and she's putting it on the table. Now, it could end poorly. It could go well. Clearly, she wants to reach uh, some independent Republican-minded voters who do watch Fox. Fox has a big audience of them. Uh, there are reports tonight, not confirmed, uh, that she's also entertaining the idea of going on Joe Rogan's podcast, the most popular podcast in the country. And that Trump is a is huge audience of young male voters. Yeah, he said he's going on it too. Although I'm, you know, I can't really necessarily take Trump at his word. Um, gonna be, gonna fact check him too. So I, it's like she uh, putting the focus back on her. These are high risk, high reward interviews. It's it's a sign of a campaign that clearly is trying to run through the tape. Um, the question I have is: Is this? And I'm not trying to be critical because she started so late, right? I mean, we keep in mind she she was just. Uh, plucked as the candidate in July or August, but is this too little, too late? The country, the big thing, her, her problem is the country still doesn't feel like it knows her. And to do that, you have to do these media blitzes. But these media blitzes are happening with just weeks to go in the election. Well, she's sitting down with Brett Baer, and he is a strong news guy. Or they can read Charlotte, yeah. your latest piece in Time magazine, because you go into detail about what kind of president VP Harris would be. You spoke to advisors of hers and veterans from five different presidential administrations. What surprised you the most? I think the thing that surprised me, frankly, when reporting this piece is, uh, you know, as I started it, I was hearing from people saying kind of what Sam was saying, like that people didn't feel like they knew her and that people didn't think that she had proposed any policies. It was like, what are Harris's policies going to be? And actually, she's proposed quite a lot of policies. She's proposed the most. So that 82 page book. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, 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 the most significant housing policy uh, ever proposed by a major presidential candidate. Candidate. She's got policies to strengthen small businesses. She wants to extend $35 insulin uh, to all Americans. She wants to allow Medicare to cover home health aids. She has these very, these, these policies that are very targeted, but also very practical. These are all very achievable. Um, and most importantly, I think the thing that, that came from my reporting is that these are all in service of the ultimate goal of her campaign, which is to beat Donald Trump, because most of all, she's running on what she won't do, which is some of the rhetoric that we saw from Trump uh, earlier just in this segment. She's not going to ban abortion. She's not going to call people who disagree with her the enemy within. Um, and so some of these policies that she's unveiling, particularly like, you know, you mentioned the policy targeted uh, at, at black male voters, those are to show the constituents that she needs to win this election. Hey, I see you. I care about you. I hear you. And my presidency is going to respond to you.